Well, I'm really excited to be here with you today. I'm Amanda, the CEO and co-founder of AI for Education. Uh, this is a very short version of a keynote that we do that's really focused on our theory of change, which is the idea of learning, experimenting, so that we can innovate. And so we're gonna get started with just a brief history of where we are. We always like to start with the level set. I think there's a expectation that everyone here as part of a generative AI conference knows what we're talking about. And what we often find is that step is kind of taken, not taken. And so we're really focused today on what generative AI is and what we're doing. And so we talk about artificial intelligence. Every single person in this room is interacts with artificial intelligence on the daily. But this opportunity now to create with generative AI has been something that's been really impactful and has changed how we do what we do. So we just did a session, Corey, shout out to Corey. We did a session on adapting assessment where we did a retirement party for uh, things like the five paragraph essay and book reports and others because we do have this opportunity now where we could use assessment to actually drive students to be as creative as possible. And so when we think about what's happened over the last you know, year and a half. This is a nice little example of a timeline. You see that ChatGPT released in November. Um, you see immediately in January what happens. New York City bans ChatGPT. And we have, a, we have a couple people from New York City in the front. I won't call you out because these are very early adopters. We have our first school that we worked with and our first school that paid us sitting next to each other. Thank you, Moses and Saida. But what we saw was there was an immediate reaction to banning this tool. So we banning generative AI as if it was something that could be banned because they were thinking chat to BT is all generative AI. And what we found is that really wasn't the case. And even though that was reversed in May, it's still essentially banned in New York City. Every school has to go through a process to take it, like to unpick it. And so students within New York City really don't have access to these tools. We've also seen that the only time that chat to BT usage went down was during the summer. And I think this is really interesting because there was this conversation on LinkedIn, the hype cycle is done, ChatGPT is done. But actually what happened was students and teachers are on break and it went right back up in August. And so we know that these tools are being used with, with schools and students and with teachers. And so we know that this is something that we can't ignore. And what we need to do is, I don't know, does anybody feel like this? I mean, you're at a conference where you have like 50 new tools and really amazing concurrent sessions, but we often feel like this is pace of change is going so fast. We're all this little girl. And if you're like me, I got really boring last year where all I can think about is AI and education, but not everyone is in this place. So the ultimate thing that we want to think about is how do we stop this feeling of being inundated by everything that's happened in generative AI and the impact on our schools? And the thing that we want to also signal is the fact that it's still really early. And so if you're doing research on this piece, we see a lot of competing um, work that's been done. But from our work with over 100 different schools, districts, and associations, I can tell you right now it's still really early in terms of adoption. And so students and teachers are doing this at different rates. But we often see that it's a really small core group of teachers and leaders that are leading the charge of gender AI, where there's a lot of people that have used it once and said, oh, it didn't really work for me, and others that'll say, I'll get there eventually, or maybe I just don't want to. Um, and so what we see is that if you're taking the opportunity right now to think about how you're supporting teachers and leaders and students, is that we have to recognize that it is still very early and there's still a lot of, a lot of time. It doesn't feel that way though. It feels like the slide before, we're all getting hit by the higher hose, but realistically, this is only a year and a half of this technology and there's a lot of way to go. So I also want to talk about, I don't know if anybody here has possibly heard that AI is for cheating. Has anybody heard that? Maybe one or two, maybe you've thought it as well. But what we see is this is a pretty good indication that there are so many more use cases for generative AI that students are experiencing. And the number one is going to be around mental health and well-being. I don't know if you've ever heard of character AI, but character AI is a tool that actually has 20% of the traffic of ChatGPT that's very popular with 16 and 24 year olds. And what you can do is you can go on and you can talk to avatars and create your own. And what we see is that these young people are spending up to two hours having conversations and having that one-to-one -one support or even a group chat now. And so they're using it a lot for places in which it really has nothing to do with their schoolwork. 
We also see, this is a thing that I think is so interesting. AI has been an assistive technology for a long time. And we actually see that students with 504 plans and IEPs are using these tools more. And also special educators tend to be early adopters because they're already familiar with what can happen. We can augment and assist with technology. So this idea that we're gonna collapse everything into AI is for cheating is just not really what's happening. And so what we do know though is there is this big elephant, right? And this is our, this is our elephant in the room, which is that we do believe that, right? That we are concerned with this. And we do believe that there is an impact on student assessment and also in student learning. But we suggest three things just to get around that. And so if you're thinking about the ways in which you are bringing in generative AI, whether you're a teacher or a leader or you're building systems, is that we really, we focus on three things. If you wanna get past that rhetoric, the first thing is transparency of use. And that doesn't mean just for students, it also means for teachers and leaders. Uh, Moses Ojeda, I'll quote him, he will tell you he thinks a lot of leaders are using generative AI and just not telling anybody about it. And we know that teachers are as well. And if teachers aren't transparent, then how can we hope that students are? So what we want to do is create systems in which we can have actual conversations about how this technology is used and the impact, and also start to have conversations about it's OK to get this support in ethical and reasonable ways. The second thing is the idea of verification of outputs. Um, hallucinations, terrible name. If you named it, if you're a tech person here that named this, I'm mad at you. It's not really a good name. It's very confusing. But it is true that these technologies have lots of inaccuracies that seem real. They seem true. We've seen plenty of lawyers get in trouble for putting in case brief that was made up. And so we need to be able to not only look at the verification of out uh, the accuracy, but also we need to be able to understand when potential bias can leak into the, the things that we are creating. And whether that's in imagery, in text, uh, in the work that we're actually doing. Also, this last piece I think is something that we don't talk about enough, which is like the idea of what is the level of originality in the things that we're creating. And so I mean that for teachers and students. If a teacher, we talk about this all the time, we do not want generative AI tools to reinforce existing practice. If you're gonna use this to make better worksheets and more worksheets, I'm coming to your house. Do not do it, that's not what it's for. And what is really original about that? How are you taking into account student needs? Their, what actually motivates them? Where their conceptual understanding is? So we wanna see level of originality not only be something that's for students only, but also for teachers. We want people to be extended and augmented and supported by these technologies and not be a place in which they're just replacing and reinforcing existing methodologies and learning. So what does that mean for everybody in the room? Um, so this is what we think of the three key actions. And we get asked this a lot, like how do you keep up with the pace of change? And I think it surprises people. We've done our 90 minute intro about 100 times since last June. And what, we've, what surprises people is that that intro has only changed 10% in the full almost year. And the reason is, is that we're not saying you have to be an AI expert and follow all these different things. But what we're doing instead is building capacity. And the way that we build capacity is focusing on AI literacy. And if you know me and you follow the work that we've done, I am really, really loud about this and have been loud about this for almost a year, which is why I'm so excited that GSV has brought us here together. And thank you to everyone on the planning committee. Michael and Sierra and Claire have done such a great job. But the important thing that we have to do is we have to build AI literacy. And when we think about AI literacy, what's fascinating about this is that I can tell you with 100% certainty that it only takes a good 90 minutes with the right support, a practical show not tell approach to start building that. This is not something that has to take 10 weeks 10 courses, 10 hours, it can be done in 90 minutes because I've watched it happen over 100 times. And the idea that it also, by building AI literacy about what it is and what it isn't, even the fact that artificial intelligence has no intelligence today is a great place of like starting to build that literacy, is that you have this opportunity when we see this is when you build your own AI literacy, you tend to wanna build the AI literacy of the people around you, right? We actually wanna go and say, oh, now I understand it. What does this mean for my students? Or do students start thinking, how can I do this to my parents and our community? And what we see here is that this idea of building capacity over expertise is really important because I do not want you to be an AI expert. I want you to be an expert pedagogue. I want you to be an expert leader. I want you to be an expert 
uh, professional, nonprofit professional, and instead I want you to augment and support the work that you do with AI, but not replace what makes you the expert, because these systems are not expert yet. There's not, no, everything out there, not one of these generative AI systems has pedagogical knowledge, does, knows right from wrong on its own, is able to do that reasoning, and so you still are going to be the expert, and that's really important. The second thing is to experiment. Oh my goodness, just try it. Um, I can get up here and tell you that I can, you know, you can build a rubric in like 10 seconds and it sounds great, but if you show that to a teacher, you will get everything from this, open mouth, oh my gosh, you changed my life. And I mean that very seriously. This is a show, not tell time. And this is really, really important. But it's also a time to fail to be weird, to try new things, to do things you never thought possible before. It's also an opportunity, if you're a leader, to start piloting and seeing these tools. You have so many amazing opportunities on the floor today, and this opportunity to experiment is really going to drive not only deeper knowledge about what the tools are, can and cannot do, but also start to see what will be possible. And I'll just say, one of the things that we did that I really loved is we did a promptathon, and we're about to do a promptathon again in May, and what we did is students and teachers came together to solve real world problems within their communities. And it was great, it demystifies it, it was no longer about cheating. But the thing that was so fascinating is that the students and the teachers learned just as much about what AI could do as what AI could not do. And so this was really fascinating. We talked about in our last thing, there was a group that was gonna use Dolly, the image generator, to build a, you know, a, a brochure with words. And if anybody's used Dolly, what is it really bad at doing? Spelling, <laughs> words, and so they did it over and over again, and what they, they actually ended up putting in their presentation a fake one where it was like fake Chinese, and only one person in the room could speak Chinese, but they do, but the reason why they did it is they actually showed, first of all, it was kind of funny, but it took the wind out, and these students were actually able to say, I can't give it all away. I cannot give this all away, all my thinking, all my work. Instead, what I can do is make a bit of a joke about it and use it differently the next time. And that's something that everyone within that room took out and took with them and will take with them. The last piece is innovate. And this is something that's so important. It was actually really interesting. I was, we were watching a, a speech at Stanford, Salcon was doing. One of the things that he said that really struck me was the idea that our imagination has not caught up with what's happening today. And what we see over and over go, again, is this idea of what is our first horizon? What is the first horizon of change? And so that tends to be teacher productivity, it tends to be efficiency, it tends to be homework help and all these pieces. But what we haven't really done is take a step back after we've built our literacy and understand what these technologies are and are not, had time to experiment, and then started to think about what innovation will really be. And so what does that mean in terms of how schools work, what students are expected to do, what teachers are expected to do? Because we, we have to do this, we have to do this. Our systems have changed. Right now, the industrial model is over 100 years old. And if you go to ChatGPT or Dolly and you ask, what does a classroom in the future look like? Every single image will have a teacher at the front of a room and students in desks and rows in some way, every time. Maybe they're grouped differently and have AR, VR, JatGPT doesn't know what the future is, and we don't either unless we actually take the time and build these actual systems to be able to think about what innovation will really look like. How do we move into a future where we actually make schools better for teachers and students? Should be our goal with generative AI, not just the application of generative AI as an end state. So I wanna say thank you so much for joining. I'm Amanda, I love this work. It is so exciting to be able to do it with you all. And we couldn't do it without the people in this room. So if you like to connect, we'd always love to have a conversation, but I just really hope that this is something that gets you thinking about, you don't have to be an expert, but you do need to start thinking about where we go next because it has to happen. Thank you everybody.